Hello everyone and welcome back to another reaction. Today we are continuing on with the Napoleonic uh, series from Epic History TV. Today we are taking a look at the 1813 German campaign, the decisive final struggle, really, for Napoleon. So without further ado, let's get going. What a career Napoleon has ruined. Having gained so much glory, he could bestow peace on Europe, but he has not done so. The spell is broken. Well, he's right about the spell being broken, but Alexander played his own part in ensuring there was no further peace in Europe after the treaties of Tilsit. He's not innocent in all this. Eighteen twelve had been a disastrous year for Napoleon. That's an understatement. His invasion of Russia had led to the almost total destruction of an army of half a million men. Now Poland and Germany were wide open to Russian attack. Some advised Emperor Alexander that this was the time to make a favorable peace with Napoleon. Russia's own armies had been mauled and Western Russia devastated. But Alexander was determined to see Napoleon defeated for good, to free Europe from his clutches, and avenge Moscow's destruction by taking Paris. Indeed, uh, there were conditions to make a favorable peace with Napoleon at this stage. However, I think Alexander correctly recognized the opportunity the disastrous invasion of Russia presented to regain Russian hegemony in uh, Europe, or at least Eastern Europe, and uh, position Russia as the preeminent global power that it would become. Napoleon's allies were deserting him. Russian troops had already agreed a truce with the Russians. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria, which assumed a policy of watchful neutrality. Yes, Napoleon's intention was for Schwarzenberg to march his corps further west to, uh, you know, strengthen the uh, French defenses in the upcoming campaign. However, the Austrians at this point, you know, realized that Napoleon was in quite a precarious situation and they could possibly. Uh, get something out of uh, this whole situation. So, um, many people prominent in the Austrian court, like Prince Metternich and the Austrian chief of staff, uh, Joseph Radetzky and Prince Schwarzenberg himself, all advocated for immediately joining the coalition against Napoleon. But uh, Emperor Francis II, was not so keen on the idea and so the compromise position was that uh, they would assume neutrality for the time being at least. Napoleon had left Marshal Murat in charge of the remnants of the army but he left for the Kingdom of Naples hoping to cut a deal with the Allies that would let him keep his throne. He was replaced by Napoleon's stepson, Eugène, who'd proved himself a brave and able soldier in Russia, but was unused to independent command, and now faced odds of four to one. Indeed, uh, Eugène had proven to be a competent Viceroy of Italy since 1805, when he was appointed. He also proved himself to be a capable general serving in the Wagram campaign, and uh, the Russian campaign, and as they said, he'd proven himself uh, able and brave, but he was um, not experienced enough to hold independent command, especially in such a precarious situation. And like I said, looking at these numbers, he's desperately outnumbered. As Russian forces advanced through Poland, he continued to retreat west, leaving garrisons to hold strategic fortresses 
most of which were soon besieged. On the 7th of February, Russian troops entered Warsaw unopposed. Napoleon's Polish client state, the Duchy of Warsaw, effectively ceased to exist. And we can see on the map that the Russians are moving quickly to grab as much land as possible before Napoleon managed to mobilize a new army. And the thought behind this is to convince the German states or, well, it's at least partially meant to convince German states and Austria to switch sides and face off against Napoleon. And while this thought was uh, good in theory, Kutuzov had some objections to this plan by the Tsar. And that's because the Russian armies had been devastated, and it would take a lot of time for reinforcements to come from the deep uh, reaches of Russia to reinforce his armies, and he didn't want to overextend his forces this early on in the campaign. But uh, he was overruled. Three weeks later, Russian troops entered Berlin, while Sweden joined the Allies. Sweden was ruled by Napoleon's former Marshal Bernadotte now officially known as Crown Prince Karl Johann. Many would accuse him of betraying Napoleon, but he'd always been clear that once he became Sweden's Crown Prince, he'd pursue Swedish interests, which is what he now claimed to do. Indeed, um, Marshal Bernadotte is uh, one of the most fascinating uh, stories of the Napoleonic Wars, going from a French general under Napoleon's command serving as the crown prince of Sweden and establishing a dynasty in Sweden uh, that continues on to this day. And, uh, well, like they said, many would accuse um, Bernadotte of betraying Napoleon, but it's important to remember that Napoleon himself did not consider Bernadotte a traitor, though he was uh, quite miffed about this whole turning against France thing, which I quite understand. And, uh, well, he, like I said, he made clear to Napoleon right from the onset that he was not going to be a client state to Napoleon's French Empire. And uh, from 1812 onwards, Karl Johan had, as he was now known, um, began to reorganize Swedish foreign policy, and he was determined to keep Sweden out of any great power conflicts in the future after Napoleon was defeated. And uh, he looked to strengthen Sweden by taking Norway from uh, Denmark. And so he's also effectively the ruler of Sweden from 1812 onwards, since uh, Charles XIII had suffered a stroke and he was pretty much incapable of ruling. So, uh, yeah, Bernadotte is a crucial player during the Sixth Coalition War, and uh, we will see him again. In exchange for Norway, to be taken from France's ally, Denmark, and one million pounds from Britain, Bernadotte agreed to join what was now the Sixth Coalition against France since the Revolution, with an army of 30,000 troops. It should be also said that Bernadotte was a trusted military advisor to Alexander I during the uh, 1812 campaign against Napoleon. And uh, he had a very good relationship with the Russians. Many Swedish people expected him to retake Finland from Russia, but, you know, he was a Frenchman and uh, he really didn't have any uh, historical ties to Finland or emotional attachment to Finland and so he did what was what made more sense geopolitically and that was to take Norway. Norway could not really be invaded um, and it was not bordering any great power so it made sense from that perspective. Ten days later King Frederick William of Prussia declared war on France. It followed weeks of indecision, 
the king was widely seen as a weak character and terrified of Napoleon. But with guarantees of Russian military support, the return of lost territory, and enormous financial and material aid from Britain, he agreed to field an army of 80,000 men. Yeah, Frederick William III is a very, very weak character, a pretty incompetent ruler, I would say. And uh, he basically had to be pressured into this war again, like he was pressured into the joining the war of the Third Coalition, but he made his decision so late that the, the Allies had already been defeated at Austerlitz at that point. And uh, yeah, he was just a, a bad, bad Prussian king. And at this point, his wife had also died. Uh, the celebrated Queen Louise, who was his most able minister, really, and closest confidant and advisor. So, yeah, he needed a lot of reinsurance before he turned his back on Napoleon. On the 17th of March, he issued a proclamation to the people of Prussia and Germany. And mein Volk, to my people, summoning them to fight for Prussia and Germany's honor in what would soon be known as the German War of Liberation. Yes, this is perhaps one of the first time a Prussian king has really addressed his people like this. And he addressed not only Prussians, but Lithuanians, Poles, and so on, and the other Germans, of course. And this was a very dramatic proclamation. A pretty good one, if you read it. It's uh, quite inspiring, I would say, and this really stoked the patriotic fervor among many Germans who wanted to cast off Napoleon's yoke. But the smaller princes and kings of the various German states were not ready at this point to abandon Napoleon because, you know, they, um, they were in a very precarious situation themselves, and uh, turning on Napoleon at this stage might have meant that they would become deposed or <laughs> their state wiped off the face of the earth. But yeah, there, it was a difficult time for the many petty kings and princes of Germany at this point, because many uh, Germans, like I said, were not very fond of this whole Napoleon thing. They were also dreaming of this uh, idea of a unified Germany. Don't know where they got that from. <laughs> the Prussian army had been greatly reformed since its humiliating defeat to Napoleon in 1806. A military commission headed by General von Scharnhorst. One of the great Prussian um, military thinkers, General von Scharnhorst, actually get a battleship named after him in World War II. So there's, a, there's that. Had sacked nearly 200 old generals and abolished flogging expanded recruitment, and introduced exams for officers, and overhauled training, tactics, and drill. Yes, Scharnhorst led this uh, great reorganization of the Prussian army, and finally the Prussian, were, Prussian army were brought up to speed, which it had not been by the 1805-1806 campaign, where it really had been almost living off the old system uh, they had during Frederick the Great. And that worked well during the Seven Years' War, but this is uh, like more than 50 years after the Seven Years' War, and uh, that system was simply outdated. And, of course, they drew on what Napoleon had accomplished with his Grande Armée. So, um, yeah... <laughs> It's, uh, they learned most of it from him, which is quite ironic, really, because one of Napoleon's maxims was to not fight your enemy too much because they would learn from you. And uh, yeah, he also mentioned expanded recruitment. Uh, they uh, raised the uh, Landwehr militia and also used the uh, Freikorps units and uh, introduced them in to fight alongside regular units. So, you know, they were of varying quality, but still, at this point, they needed all the men they could 
grab a hold of, basically, to fight off against Napoleon, who would conduct a great mobilization himself. When Napoleon met the new Prussian army in battle two months later, he remarked, these animals have learned something. Very famous quote. About Small this. consolation, they'd learned most of it from him. Only a short time ago, I was the conqueror of the world, commanding the largest and finest army of modern times. That's all gone now. Napoleon to Count Molay, Tuileries Palace, February 1813. Yep, um, the Grand Army of 1812 was indeed the largest army Europe had ever seen, for sure. The finest, well, that's debatable. Uh, the finest army he had was during the Ulm and Austerlitz campaign of 1805, but still. It's all gone? Yeah, it's all gone at this point. As his enemies massed in Germany, Napoleon was in Paris, working tirelessly to build a new army with which to face them. 137,000 new conscripts joined the army. Yeah. And those, keep in mind that these conscripts, uh, he was only able to get this many new conscripts uh, by calling up the class of 1813 and 1814 early, which meant that these conscripts were mostly teenagers. And laws passed to call up 100,000 more, while 40,000 veterans from the army in Spain, 16,000 marines, and 80,000 men of the National Guard, a home defense force, were transferred to Germany. The troops from Spain and the Marines were quite good, especially the Marines. They were elite troops uh, on par with the Imperial Guard. But the National Guard's men were perhaps of an even more dubious quality than the conscripts. These were meant to, uh, you know, it was a basically a garrison militia meant to be in France, you know, so the country was not completely defenseless. It was the first line of uh, defense, basically, and uh, could help with internal security and stuff like that. They were not really meant for use in uh, regular campaigns. But... You know, Napoleon is sort of scraping the barrel here. He needs to grab everything he can get. He can't be picky. And infantrymen are easier to replace than cavalry. In theory, you could train these troops to become an effective fighting force relatively quickly. More problems with the cavalry, though. The new conscripts were nicknamed Marie Louises after Napoleon's young wife, who passed the new conscription laws in his absence. They were young and raw. Two-thirds were teenagers. And there was a severe lack of experienced officers and NCOs. In short, the countless irreplaceable veterans now lying beneath Russian soil. Yeah, and that's uh, another point to remember. Uh, these conscripts were called up even before the Russian campaign was over, Napoleon had uh, made sure that his wife, Marie-Louise, called up these conscription classes early. And also, uh, like they said, uh, like I mentioned before, young and raw, and they lacked leadership. Many armies, you have the professional officer corps, of course, they are very important, the generals the colonels, and all that. But then you have the NCOs, those who lead the battalions on the field and all that, and lead the demi-brigades. And these were the sergeants, basically. And they were very important for the leadership of the Grande Armée. So not having those around to lead these young conscripts was uh, not ideal, to be sure. There was also a critical shortage of cavalry, a crisis mocked by British satirists. 
it would take Napoleon longer to replace the many thousands of horses and trained horsemen who perished in Russia. Yes, and I believe this is uh, why Napoleon, spoiler alert, would not win the 1813 campaign. This severe lack of cavalry just proved too decisive too many times uh, during the 1813 campaign. And uh, basically Napoleon had to scour all of France and all his satellite states to grab any horse he could find because he'd lost, uh, what, a quarter of a million horses in Russia? And uh, that would include cavalry horses and uh, transport horses. And so, you know, um, it's not easy finding replacement horses. And then you have to train cavalrymen, training someone to ride on horseback and fight on horseback. Well, that's going to take a lot more time than training to learn, uh, training someone how to shoot a musket and reload it. When Napoleon left Paris for Germany in mid-April, the French situation was precarious. Eugène had been forced back behind the river Elbe to the fortified city of Magdeburg. Dresden, the capital of Saxony, had fallen to the Prussians. The duchy of mecklenburg schwerin became the first German state to defect from Napoleon's Confederation of the Rhine. Russian Cossacks raided as far as Hamburg, inspiring local revolts against French occupying forces. Just like in the 1812 campaigns, the Russian used the flying columns of Cossacks to raid deep into enemy territory, disrupt lines of communications and supplies, and they were really quite invaluable to the Russians, uh, both in this campaign and the previous one. Meanwhile, Austria stood on the sidelines, so far declining to back either side. Napoleon's miraculous feat of organization meant he now had more than 200,000 troops in Germany. And the Emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. The morale of his army was high. It's really quite a remarkable feat of organization and it's just a testament to Napoleon's brilliance as an administrator, which we don't talk about often. We talk about his military campaigns, but Napoleon was a political and administrative genius too. And this is one of the greatest examples of this. Despite everything, he managed to somehow raise 200,000 men, and he would raise 200,000 men more in the months to come. And it's just absolutely insane how he was able to do this. Sure, the quality is not the same, but, you know, still. It's uh, really quite remarkable. And like they said, the Emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. Most Frenchmen at this point still believed in the Emperor's legendary battlefield reputation. And uh, it's quite rare to have such a figure in history that has such magnetism to inspire his troops and his people. And... Uh, I don't think we will ever see someone like Napoleon or Julius Caesar or Alexander ever again. It's just not going to happen, I'm afraid. The Russians, on the other hand, lost their iconic commander, Field Marshal Kutuzov, to pneumonia. Yeah, Kutuzov, I believe he received a wound and it got infected and it somehow led to the pneumonia. I might be wrong there. But still, a big loss for Russia. Kutuzov was um, a good moderating influence on Alexander I. Um, Alexander was, um, as we all know, not a great military guy. He was often overzealous and had a flair for the dramatic. But Kutuzov was uh, a composed type and, uh, you know, he had the right ideas. Uh, even though some, I'm not saying it, but some might accuse him of being a bit too cautious sometimes. On the 28th of April, his role was taken over by General Wittgenstein. He will not last Russian long. Russian troops were exhausted and far from home. Their army weakened by the need to contain French garrisons across Poland and Germany. 
Russia and Sweden had yet to fully mobilize their strength, and Allied forces barely mustered 100,000 men. They were now heavily outnumbered by Napoleon, and the French Emperor decided to strike quickly. He ordered Marshal Davout to Hamburg with 35,000 men to secure his northern flank. Yeah, and this is one of those moves in history that I do not understand, and I don't think we will ever quite understand why Napoleon sent Davu, one of his most skilled, perhaps the most skilled battlefield commander he had, to Hamburg to just sit there and protect the northern strategic flank. Don't get me wrong, it was an important job, and it needed someone who was capable of independent command, and Napoleon did not have those commanders in vast uh, overflow. But still, why would you send Davu to Hamburg to just sit there? It's really quite strange, really. He would march against the Russian and Prussian forces converging on Leipzig to force a decisive battle. Victory would make Austria think twice about joining the Allies, allow him to rescue the 90,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, and re-establish his dominance over Europe. If the art of war was only the art of not taking risk, glory would belong to the mediocrities. We need a full triumph. Indeed, Napoleon, one of history's greatest uh, gamblers, really, in terms of uh, battlefield uh, tactics, at least. And Napoleon was very aggressive, and he often took risks, and most of the time it paid off. Uh, but, as we will see, now he doesn't have quite the army or the commanders to pull it off quite the way he did in his younger days. As Napoleon advanced on Leipzig, the Allies faced a predicament. To risk battle against Napoleon's larger army, or give up Germany without a fight, a potentially devastating blow to Allied morale and any chance of winning Austria over to their cause. Allied headquarters made the bold decision to attack. They knew most of Napoleon's army was made up of raw conscripts, that their own troops were better trained and had a great superiority in cavalry and artillery. All of this is true, but what they don't mention here is that the, the main weakness of the coalition forces was command and control. There was disunified command between the various countries' uh, commanders, and it would cause many problems over the course of this whole campaign. And it uh, was a problem that never really resolved itself. And uh, it's only thanks really to, like they said, all the other advantages that they were able to defeat Napoleon anyways. But it was a great weakness compared to the French, where there was a single unified command under Napoleon. The Allies agreed that as Napoleon crossed the Sarla River, they would hit his right flank before he could concentrate the full mass of his forces. The two armies were on a collision course, but Napoleon's shortage of cavalry meant he lacked information about Allied movements. On the 1st of May, Marshal Bessier, commanding the cavalry in Murat's absence, was carrying out reconnaissance himself when he was hit by a cannonball and killed instantly. Bessier was the second of Napoleon's marshals to be killed in action, and like Lan, an old comrade and trusted friend. Yes, the loss of Marshal Bessier, although not as great a loss as Marshal Lan was, uh, Bessier was still a reliable commander of the Imperial Guard during many of Napoleon's campaigns, and he was also an able cavalry commander, um, the second most able after Murat himself. I could say, you could argue at least. There were others like General Lasalle, but he's also been dead for a while now, so you know, 
Um, Napoleon could not afford to lose these reliable commanders. And uh, like I said, he was a personal friend, a loyal friend to Napoleon, and it was a devastating blow to, to Napoleon. Just uh, on an emotional level. The Allies were able to surprise Napoleon, falling on Marshal Ney's third corps near Lutzen. And why? Well, Ney decided to ignore his orders from Napoleon to scout ahead. And that's just typical of Ney. He likes to do things his own way and it uh, doesn't really work out at this stage. Ney's troops had to cling on in the face of a Russian and Prussian onslaught, while Napoleon rapidly redirected his other corps to fall on the enemy's flanks. At one stage, Napoleon had to personally help rally routing troops as they broke in the face of determined Prussian assaults. But on the whole, his young conscripts fought with courage. And despite hours of savage fighting, Wittgenstein could not exploit his early advantage. As French reinforcements arrived, the battle turned against him. Towards dusk, the Allies were forced to break off the engagement. Though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties, losing just half as many men. General von Scharnhorst, mortally wounded, was among them. Yes, so the Battle of Lützen was a, a victory for the French, but a costly one. And it shows the disparity in uh, artillery, in cavalry, in just overall training of the troops between these two armies. And uh, like they said, the French did fight well, the conscripts did fight well. And uh, Napoleon, he was very active during the battle. He rode back and forth, r rallying, routing troops and turning the army around for another charge, basically. And uh, that was typical of Napoleon. Um, it was quite rare in his later campaigns that he would do such a thing. But when he did, it was such a, as described by many accounts, an electrifying feeling. Like, Napoleon was worth so much on the battlefield. Um, just his pure presence was enough to rally troops. And... Uh, yeah, we have a major loss for the coalition side here, uh, General von Scharnhorst, who was, I believe, was wounded in the foot, and, uh, you know, that wound got infected, and it proved fatal. So, you know, a minor infection well, could be deadly in those days. So, uh, yeah, it's quite a way to go. Crucially, Napoleon's lack of cavalry meant he was unable to pursue the enemy, who retreated in good order. Expecting the Prussians to fall back on Berlin, Napoleon sent Marshal Ney in pursuit, while he continued east. But the Allied army stayed together, withdrawing to a defensive position at Bautzen, deliberately close to the Austrian border hoping to entice Schwarzenberg to intervene and daring Napoleon to violate Austrian neutrality. Ironically, Napoleon thought the same thing, uh, that the Austrians maybe could intervene on his side instead. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but neither would happen. Neither happened. Instead, Napoleon ordered Ney to swing south to fall on the Allies' northern flank, while he launched a frontal assault to pin them in place. The battle lasted two days, as French infantry struggled forward against the Prussian and Russian lines. But a misunderstanding over Ney's orders caused a delay that allowed the Allies to narrowly escape Napoleon's trap. The battle plan was a, a good one from Napoleon at Bautzen. He would pin them in place, Ney would uh, circle around and cut off the Russian retreat and encircle them, basically. But uh, Ney had received some poorly drafted orders. They were very brief. 
and they didn't explain enough what Ney should do exactly. So Ney got um, caught up in a battle for a village he should have just bypassed. And, uh, well, this was uh, one of the great chances Napoleon had to dealing a devastating blow to the coalition forces. War could have ended right here if it was a uh, success, this plan of Napoleon's. Alas, it was not to be. Once more, the Allies fought with great determination and inflicted many more losses than they suffered. There were more casualties during the pursuit, including the next day, General Duroc, Grand Marshal of the Palace, responsible for Napoleon's personal arrangements and his closest surviving friend. Riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree and disemboweled him. Yikes. His slow, painful death. Yeah, they no, Napoleon. that's that's not a good way to die. The emperor continued his pursuit to Breslau, once again hindered by his lack of experienced cavalry, while Udino was sent north to take Berlin, but was held at Luckau by von Bülow's Prussian corps. On the second yeah, of June, it was um, the army of the north under Crown Prince Karl Johann, who was in charge of the defense of Berlin. And uh, Napoleon would try to get the Prussian capital, uh, but it was held by uh, the Army of the North for the remainder of this campaign. Uh, Udino was the first to try, though. With both sides strained to breaking point, neutral Austria proposed a ceasefire, which, to the surprise of many, Napoleon accepted. I believe Napoleon also had sent a ceasefire uh, offer to Tsar Alexander, though he was not serious about it. My eagles are again victorious, but my star is setting. Napoleon to General Kolanko, Saxony, 2nd of May 1813. It's uh, quite a statement by Napoleon. It shows he. I think he knows by this point where things are heading. He still believes he can win, don't get me wrong. But he knows that he's running out of time here to land a decisive victory. The armistice of Plaswitz would last more than two months. A period of intense diplomacy and military mobilization by both sides. Napoleon wanted time to rebuild his cavalry, a shortage of which had allowed the Allies to escape twice. But he also wanted to keep Austria on side, which he feared might join the Allies with 200,000 troops, even though Emperor Francis I was now his father-in-law, since Napoleon's marriage to his daughter Marie-Louise in 1810. Austrian Foreign Minister Clemens von Metternich, who'd become one of 19th century Europe's most influential statesmen, now took center stage. Prince Metternich is uh, the most influential figure during the first half of the uh, 19th century, uh, the most influential diplomatic political figure in Europe. And he is rivaled only in the 19th century by Otto von Bismarck himself. So this is quite a man who will play a major role in reshaping Europe after the Napoleonic Wars. Metternich wanted peace and to see Austria restored as a great European power, which meant Napoleon contained, but not crushed which would hand too much power to Russia. In June, he traveled to Dresden to ask Napoleon to make concessions, while promising the Allies that if he did not, Austria would join. Oh, I just remembered after Bautzen, um, Wittgenstein was sacked as the commander in chief of the Russian armed forces, and uh, Barclay uh, was appointed as the commander in chief again. Um, so 
Napoleon's old nemesis from the 1812 campaign is back. And it was a good appointment in my opinion. Uh, Barclay had done well. Anyways, that was a side tangent. It's nothing to do with this. Then. But Napoleon dismissed Metternich's terms out of hand. He would not return the Illyrian provinces to Austria, agree to the repartition of Poland, or the breakup of the Confederation of the Rhine. All were out of the question. Yes, these demands were quite severe on Metternich's part. France would still be allowed to keep the Kingdom of Italy as a satellite state. They would um, continue to have Switzerland as a satellite state. Belgium and the Netherlands would still be in French possession. So it was not a bad deal. But considering Napoleon here, uh, Napoleon at this stage has maybe a 50-50 chance of going out, winning this conflict. Napoleon certainly thought he could still win the campaign at this point. And like he, uh, I think he said this to Metternich that um, his ruler, Francis, could sit, uh, could lose 20 battles and, you know, he could still come home to his castle and still be fine. Napoleon does not have that luxury because his entire rise to power and reign is built on constant military success. It is not based on bloodlines or a long-held loyalty by the people to his dynasty or anything like that. His rule is based on his military prowess. And he says basically that he would last, not last one day if the people of France and the people around him sense the weakness. And he is uh, probably correct there that Napoleon could not agreed to any of these terms really because it would be perceived as a great sign of weakness and he would be promptly deposed and um, he's probably exaggerating a, a little bit but still it would be a great um, blow to his political capital at home in Paris so there are many factors at play here that we need to consider when uh, thinking about whether Napoleon should have taken this deal or not Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Peace and war lie in your majesty's hands, Metternich is said to have warned him. Today you can still make peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. But Napoleon preferred war to what he called a humiliating peace. It would have been a humiliating peace. It's not wrong there. Expect to defeat whenever the Emperor attacks in person. Attack and defeat his lieutenants whenever you can. General Moreau to Emperor Alexander. Uh, yeah, General Moreau was one of the most successful commanders of the, Napole uh, the French Revolutionary Wars. He was a French general. He was exiled by Napoleon after he was accused of uh, plotting to assassinate the Emperor. And uh, yeah... After that, he served at the court of Alexander I and was a military advisor, basically. And he is one of the men who will uh, help to author the famous Trackenberg plan that we will probably get into. On the 12th of August, 1813, Austria joined the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. The Allies now had a numerical advantage of 3 to 2, and a new strategy, the Trachenberg Plan. Recognizing Napoleon's genius, the Allies would avoid battle with the Emperor and instead target his marshals, threaten his flanks and wear down French forces, until it was time to close in for the kill. Yes, there were several people involved in drafting the Trackenberg plan, and it was basically an amalgam of two different plans, the Trackenberg Protocol and the Reichenbach plan. Um, the key authors were um, Bernadotte, 
Crown Prince Carl Johan. He was a former French Marshal. He had insights into the Grand Armée's strategies and tactics and into Napoleon's own thinking. And uh, another one involved was Moreau. And then there was also the Austrian Chief of Staff, Josef Radetzky, who would play a prominent role in the 1848 revolutions, which is a video we'll probably get to eventually. So, um, yes. Um, although um, it's agreed that the most important player here was probably Crown Prince Karl Johan, uh, because of his personal insights. And uh, it was a good plan. It really was, because Napoleon um, was still, even though he was um, sort of a far cry from his younger days of, as a military commander, he was still very dangerous to take on. And so why not just ignore him? Because his marshals are not nearly as competent. And as we have established during the course of this series, Napoleon has a severe lack of uh, talented independent commanders. Davu is one of them, but he's stuck with the 13th Corps in Hamburg. And uh, Sult, he's back in Spain trying to salvage the the remains of what uh, is left of the Bonapartist Kingdom of Spain. So, who has he on to rely on? Udino and Ney? These people were not capable of independent command, so it was a good plan and it will work brilliantly, really. Over the next few months, the coalition would also receive massive material support from Britain. As they always did. Including 8 million pounds in silver and gold coin, 200 cannon with transport, 120,000 firearms, 18 million rounds of ammunition, 23,000 barrels of gunpowder, 30,000 swords and sabres, 150,000 uniforms, 175,000 pairs of boots, 1.5 million pounds of beef, biscuit and flour, and 28,000 gallons of rum and brandy. And this was typical of the British. Uh, they never fielded a huge um, field army of their own, except in Spain, where they had a decent sized force. But compared to the great European armies here in Central Europe, uh, what the British fielded was virtually nothing. But they could support the Allies with uh, money and supplies, and that they did. And uh, it was an astronomical cost to the British Crown, or the British government rather. But it was still cheaper than fielding an entire field army like the other great European powers did. So they decided this was a cheaper and more effective option. By the end of the war, the British had run up a enormous debt. Um, I don't have the exact number, but it's uh, it's it's mind blowing numbers for the time, at least considering inflation and all that. So yeah, uh, this support was crucial uh, in helping the coalition out. You know, um, be prepared for the onslaught of Napoleon. The total value of British aid to the coalition in 1813 was 11.3 million pounds. Today, worth around half a billion dollars. Now, half a billion dollars in today's money is not all that much for a, for a common person. Uh, it's a lot of money, but you know, on the grand scheme of things, half a billion dollars is a drop in the ocean, basically. But we have to consider inflation here. So... 11.3 million pounds back then was, and I, I'm not joking, it is an astronomical amount of money spent on this campaign alone. Napoleon, meanwhile, had turned Dresden into a major supply depot and strengthened his cavalry arm, though it remained a pale shadow of its glorious past. Murat returned to lead it, his secret approach to the Allies having been rebuffed. But when news arrived of King Joseph's disastrous defeat to Wellington's Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army at the Battle of Vittoria, Napoleon had to send Marshal Soult, one of his best commanders, to salvage the situation. Look, he's got Soult and Suchet 
stuck in Spain. Imagine what difference they could have made uh, during the 1813 German campaign alongside Davu. It's, uh, it's something to think about. On the 15th of August, Napoleon left Dresden and advanced against what he considered the most urgent threat. The joint Prussian-Russian army of Silesia, commanded by General Gebhard von Blücher, soon to win the nickname Marshal Vorwärts, Marshal Forwards, for his aggressive leadership. Blücher is one of the most prominent commanders of the Napoleonic Wars, and probably the only one who rivaled Napoleon in terms of aggressiveness in strategy and tactics. Uh, and that's quite a feat. In of itself. But Blücher followed the new plan and retreated when he learned of Napoleon's advance. Napoleon then received news from Marshal Saint-Serre, holding Dresden with 20,000 men, that Schwarzenberg's gigantic army of Bohemia was approaching, and the city and its supplies were in danger. That's an understatement, considering Marshal Saint-Serre was uh, outnumbered uh, 10 to 1 at this point. Napoleon left Marshal Macdonald to keep an eye on Blücher and raced back to Dresden, sending Van Damme's first corps to threaten Schwarzenberg's communications. By the time the Allied assault began, enough reinforcements had arrived to fight off the attack. Yes, and this is partially due a fault of Prince Schwarzenberg. Tsar Alexander wanted to attack Dresden on the 25th of August. Schwarzenberg wanted to wait for more reinforcement, so they waited until the 26th, which gave Napoleon enough time to reach the city with his own forces. So, you know, uh, Schwarzenberg was a very cautious commander, and uh, I mean, he was not bad, but he was too cautious, basically, for this era, really. The next day, despite being heavily outnumbered, Napoleon ordered a counterattack. Struggling through mud and heavy rain, Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's second corps, broke the Allied left flank and took 13,000 prisoners. The Allies had suffered a disastrous defeat because they'd ignored their own rule don't take on Napoleon in battle. You know, I've seen uh, various numbers about this battle. I've seen as low as 25,000 Allied casualties and as much as 40,000. So, you know, the truth is somewhere in between there, surely. But regardless, um, the Battle of Dresden was probably Napoleon's last great victory. Um, Victor and Murat broke the left flank. They took an entire division uh, they captured an entire division, then Napoleon hit them in the right flank, and uh, Schwarzenberg's line of communications were not enough to handle all of these rapid moves by Napoleon, and he was just overwhelmed. But news soon arrived that turned the situation on its head. Marshal Oudinot had resumed his advance on Berlin with 66,000 men, but in three days of heavy combat around Grossbiren, he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the North. Some of the most savage fighting was between Napoleon's Saxon allies and von Bülow's Prussians, two German states that for now remained on opposing sides. Three days later, at the Katzbach River, Blücher inflicted a crushing defeat on Marshal Macdonald driving some French troops into the river itself. Yeah, the Battle of the Katzbach River was uh, a really messy and chaotic battle. And uh, Macdonald was quite unfortunate that he advanced while a rainstorm hit them. And then Blücher was able to exploit this and uh, completely destroy Macdonald. Macdonald lost 30,000 men, three eagles and a hundred guns, 
For blue cars, I've seen more devastating casualties. casualty numbers for the French. Three days after Napoleon's victory at Dresden, as Van Damme's corps pursued the Allies, it became trapped in wooded valleys around Kulm. Yeah, Van Damme has been given 50,000 men at this point to come around, circle and circle around and cut off the lines of retreat for Schwarzenberg because the crossing point here is uh, at this area here was uh, a bit complicated to navigate. So this was a great opportunity for Napoleon to inflict a heavy blow on the uh, even heavier blow on the army of Bohemia, which is the main allied force, remember? So, uh, um, unfortunately, Van Damme was quite overconfident and he got himself trapped here. And yeah, he got taken prisoner and his entire force is basically gone. And was overrun. General Van Damme himself was dragged from his horse by Cossacks as he and 10,000 of his men were made prisoner. Napoleon sent Ney to take over from Oudinot, who engaged Bülow's Prussian corps at Denewitz. The Prussians, fighting to save Berlin, held their own until Russian and Swedish reinforcements arrived to turn the battle decisively in the Allies' favor. Yeah, the Battle of Denewitz, um, Ney lost control of the situation he advanced headlong into the prussians um forgetting to reinforce his flanks from other arriving troops so yeah this is uh, shows the limitation of ney's uh, skills as an army commander ney's retreat became a rout with the loss of another 22000 men Napoleon's brilliant victory at Dresden had been completely overturned in just 10 days. The Allied plan was working. Napoleon became increasingly frustrated as Allied armies withdrew wherever he advanced and advanced wherever he was not. His teenage conscripts were exhausted by constant marching and famished as Saxony had been stripped bare of supplies. Thousands fell sick, thousands more deserted. Russian and Prussian light troops were now operating behind Napoleon's army, harassing his communications with France. And not only that, harassing his supply lines and forcing Napoleon to divert thousands of troops to defend these supplies and communications lines. And remember, he's already outnumbered at the onset of this campaign, and the Allies are still mobilizing forces. They're still bringing up reinforcements from the East. And so the situation is not going to get better for Napoleon. So he needs every man he can get for all of these battles, and having to divert these troops to defend supply lines is just... Uh, yeah, it's, it just exacerbates the, um, exacerbates the already bad situation he's got himself into. Many of Napoleon's marshals advised him to pull back to the River Rhine. But Napoleon wasn't giving up Germany without a fight. That was probably sound advice. But if he does that, he will lose all of Germany. And that is conundrum. And the Germans are... The German states are what basically supplies many men and uh, just supplies to his uh, Grande Armée. So he can't afford to lose them if he wants to continue the fight. At the same time, he can't really stay around this area because he's getting his ass kicked. So uh, yeah, he's in quite a bind at this point. There will inevitably be a great battle at Leipzig. So to solve this conundrum Napoleon has found himself in, he, uh, he can only do one thing, and that is to concentrate his forces and risk everything on one battle. By October 1813, 
Napoleon faced a third of a million Allied troops in Germany, converging on him from three directions. 900 miles away, Field Marshal Wellington was crossing the Bidassoa River into France, the first enemy army on French soil in nearly 20 years. While the Kingdom of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides and would declare war on France on the 14th of October. Napoleon planned to defend the line of the River Elbe. But the arrival of General Bennigsen's reserve Russian army freed up Blücher, who suddenly marched to join forces with Bernadotte and forced his way across the Elbe at Wartenberg. Napoleon went north with 150,000 men, seeking the decisive battle that would change his fortunes. But once more, Blücher narrowly escaped him. Then came news from Murat, who'd been left with 67,000 men to cover Schwarzenberg. The enemy had bypassed Dresden and was heading for Leipzig. If the city fell, Napoleon would be cut off from France. Once more, he was advised to fall back to the Rhine. But instead, Napoleon ordered all his forces to concentrate at Leipzig. Once Napoleon made up his mind about something, it was extremely difficult, if not impossible, to talk him out of it. So, yeah, this battle is going to happen whether they want it or not. He would risk everything in one great battle to decide the fate of his empire and the fate of Europe. All right, we've reached the end of the video. We've been going for quite a while. I'm sure this video is going to be an over an hour long, but you know, uh, that's just how it goes with these videos. I have lots to say and, and, and um, I try to hold back <laughs> so it doesn't become a two, three hour video. But still, uh, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and uh, leave a comment for uh, some more context, something that I missed, something you want to correct me on. Uh, I'm certainly not above reproach in that respect, uh, but yeah. So I'll see you guys uh, next time where we'll check out the Battle of Vitoria. We're going back to Spain. Oh, the joy. But yeah, thank you guys for joining me and I'll see you guys next time.